Good morning and welcome to our program on this Lord's Day morning. I hope that you're doing well and we would love to extend an invitation to you to join us in services today at Pyburn Street Church of Christ. We will come together this morning at 9 o'clock for Bible study. We'll have classes available for all ages. Following our Bible class period, we'll enter into the worship hour at 9.50. We will also gather this evening at 6 o'clock, and tonight will be our monthly question and answer night. And we always have a very good study on the third Sunday night of the month where I answer questions that have been submitted by either members of the congregation or those in our online listening audience. We would love for you to come and be with us tonight for that service. Also, we're engaged on Wednesday nights at 6 o'clock in our Summer on the Mountain Summer Series. We're studying through the Sermon on the Mount, and we have different speakers coming each Wednesday night. This week, we have Brother Evan Smith from the Commissary Church of Christ over near Paragold, and Brother Evan will be speaking on the subject, Christ Came to Fulfill. And we know that he'll have an outstanding lesson, and we hope that you can come on Wednesday night at 6 o'clock and join us for our summer series. Now let's get into our lesson for this morning. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 15, What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Many times in our worship to God, we find ourselves guilty of simply singing words and not giving due attention to the meaning of the words that we sing. Many times we get wrapped up in trying to sound good or fretting over how the leader conducts a song and we fail to realize the greatest aspect of our singing. Paul tells us in Colossians 3 and verse 16 that we are to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Friends, what this means is that when we sing, we are to be learning and teaching biblical concepts. But when we focus simply upon the melody and not upon the message, we fail to gain the encouragement and the edification that is available in these beautiful songs. Well, in keeping with the theme of our lessons from last week, this morning we're going to examine another great old hymn, one that is entitled, Tell Me the Story of Jesus. This hymn was written in the mid-1800s by a lady named Fanny Crosby. She came to be known as a great hymn writer, having penned several hundred during her lifetime. But Fanny Crosby holds a distinction among hymn writers in that she was totally blind. When she was still an infant, she developed an eye infection, and her doctors took her to see a doctor that turned out to be a fraud, and as a result, his treatment caused her to lose her eyesight. Well, for several years in early adulthood, she struggled with depression due to her infirmity. But eventually, she overcame this disability and went on to become one of the greatest hymn writers of all time. Some of the songs that she wrote, A Wonderful Savior, To God Be the Glory, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior, and blessed assurance. Also, the song that we are discussing this morning, Tell Me the Story of Jesus. In this study, we're going to examine this song one verse at a time and hopefully grow to a much deeper understanding of this song. The first verse says, Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell how the angels in chorus sang as they welcomed his birth, Glory to God in the highest, peace and good tidings on earth. This hymn begins with a plea that should pour out of the mouths of every Christian. We should always have a desire to learn more about the life of Christ. The one who, as Jesus himself said in Matthew 20 and verse 28, came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Also the one who is now seated at the right hand of the one true and living God. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 2 verses 5 and 6, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. 
Friends, this verse conveys to us another great reason that we should strive to know more about Jesus. He is serving as a mediator between us and God. But not only should we have a desire to hear the gospel, we should strive to take it in and apply it, to write on our hearts every word. Paul wrote in Romans 2 and verse 15, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the mean while accusing or else excusing one another. The desire for greater knowledge and understanding of God's word should be one that is never ending. We should have this constant desire to learn more about Jesus. Well, due to the fact that the story of Jesus is a story of unending love for mankind that led to Christ's death in order to make salvation available to all of mankind, this is by far the most precious and sweetest story ever told. It tells the story of the Son of God leaving the joys of heaven and coming to this sinful earth where he suffered and bled and died to take away our sins. And by Jesus laying down his life for us, it clarifies to us his statement in John 15 and verse 13 where he says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And this is exactly what Christ did for us. And he did it because of his love for us. And friends, what could be more precious than that? It's the sweetest thing that ever has been heard. The second part of this verse goes back to the birth of Christ. In the most vivid account that we find of Jesus' birth, we see certain things that led to rejoicing in heaven when Christ was born. In Luke 2, verses 13 and 14, We read, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill toward man. But what was it that was so unusual about the birth of Christ that the angels and the heavenly host would proclaim such a powerful statement of praise? Well, Matthew 1 and verse 23 gives us the answer. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Friends, everything about the birth of Christ was unique. Everything about it, from the physical to the spiritual. This birth was like none other. He was born of a virgin. He was born in the city of Bethlehem, which was a fulfillment of prophecy. He was born in a stable and laid in a manger. He was given the name Emmanuel, which denoted his deity. The name Emmanuel, as the verse tells us, means God with us. And John tells us in John 1, verses 1 and 2, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Then skipping down to verse 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and of truth. This child who was born into such humble surroundings was none other than the Son of God in the form of a man. The story of Jesus' birth has been studied countless times by each one of us, I'm sure. But no doubt, each time we read it, we feel a sense of excitement over the amazing events that surround it. Therefore, let us always declare the full counsel of the gospel, which is the sweetest story ever told. Then we come to verse number 2, which reads, Fasting alone in the desert, tell of the days that are past, how for our sins he was tempted, yet was triumphant at last. Tell of the years of his labor, tell of the sorrow he bore. He was despised and afflicted, homeless, rejected, and poor. This verse begins by drawing our minds back to the temptation of Christ. According to Matthew 4, verses 1 and 2, immediately following Jesus' baptism, Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward hungered. When we think about the way Christ must have felt physically, We cannot help but be both moved and encouraged with his strength in the face of such strong temptation. None of us have ever gone anywhere remotely as long without eating as Christ did. But we do know the discomfort that is felt when we're hungry. We need to understand 
that what Jesus used to overcome these temptations was not his own will, was not his own physical or mental strength, but he used the word of God. This he suffered for our sins. Suffered these temptations so that he could leave us an example. In referring to Christ, the writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 4 and verse 15, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And we know that this temptation was required of him, so that, as Hebrews 2 and verse 18 tells us, For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. After the third and final temptation, Jesus had been victorious over all Satan's snares. And he said to Satan in Matthew 4 and verse 10, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. The second part of this verse deals with the suffering that he went through during his earthly ministry. The prophet Isaiah, in foretelling about the coming of Christ, said in Isaiah 53 and verse 3, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. The time that Jesus spent on this earth, friends, was not an easy time. As Isaiah tells us, he was despised and rejected by his kinsmen, the Jews. He was well acquainted with grief, as verse 4 tells us, and surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. The ones who should have been the most prepared to accept Christ were the very ones who were treating him the worst. Jesus himself affirmed the fact that he was despised by the world. He stated in John 15 and verse 18, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Also, we know that Jesus was considered homeless, for he said in Luke 9 and verse 58 that foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And as a result, he traveled through the life, through this life from place to place and had very little monetary support from any source. Paul gives us evidence to support this in 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9, where he says, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Friends, let us remember the things that Christ suffered for our sakes while he was on this earth. And then we notice the third verse, just very, very briefly. Tell of the cross where they nailed him, writhing in anguish and pain. Tell of the grave where they laid him. Tell how he liveth again. Love in that story so tender, clearer than ever I see. Stay, let me weep while you whisper. Love paid the ransom for me. Friends, we've all seen images and read accounts of the heinous act known as crucifixion. In crucifixions, a victim is attached to a rough wooden pole with a cross member near the top, and they're attached to this cross with metal spikes driven through the wrists of each hand and through each foot. As the victim hung there dangling by their arms, blood was not able to circulate to their vital organs, and the victims would die of suffocation, normally after a long period of agony and pain and dishonor. Well, most biblical scholars agree that this scourging that he went through prior to being nailed to the cross was more intense than the crucifixion itself. And it was typical with the Romans to scourge those who were going to be crucified either by beating them with rods or with some type of whip just before their crucifixion. And Jesus was scourged with whips, as the Greek word here used denotes, persons of Roman birth and blood and free citizens of Rome, they were beaten with rods. But servants as Christ was, were considered lesser individuals of lesser significance and they were beaten with whips which oftentimes would lead to their death before they ever made it to the crucifixion. But even though Jesus was nailed to the cross, even though he died there, he rose again. So we see in the words of this song, Love in that story so tender, Clearer than ever I see, Stay, let me weep while you whisper, Love 
has paid the ransom for me. Yes, friends, tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Friends, we thank you so much for joining us for our program today. We hope that you will consider the things that we've discussed and have a blessed Lord's Day.